Welcome to Orange Pill Podcast. We have Brandon Quidden coming up on the show and we talk about reflexivity of the cycles of humans. Exactly. That's right, Max. And we also, you know what, I just want to say, make sure you check out swanbitcoin.com forward slash Stacy. My name is S-T-A-C-Y. If you want to start stacking Bitcoin, it's never too late. Of course, we have a dip now, so you can also smash by over at swanbitcoin.com forward slash Stacy. And if you want to secure your Bitcoin, make sure you go to keys.casa and secure your Bitcoins there with a really great secure service that they have there and use the the discount code orange pill all one word just like this i even wrote it out for you mm. look at that orange pill it might be too bright mm. orange pill mm. anyway orange pill orange pill like that and um you write one word and you get 10 percent off of your yearly income and uh, your yearly cost of your service at keys.casa and right now we want to throw to our sponsor an ad from our sponsor thesunexchange.com forward slash orange pill sun exchange is the world's first peer-to-peer -peer solar leasing platform earn bitcoin solar power in communities in africa and be part of the new world economy visit thesunexchange.com forward slash orange pill and start monetizing sunshine today Right. Max, what do you think of the ad that we always run at the top of every Orange Pill episode? Couldn't be better. It's a great product. Stack sats from the sun. Have the sun stack your sats for you. What a great idea. Worship the sun. Have the sun convert sun energy into Bitcoin. Ooh la! Well, definitely stack sats, not bananas. That's definitely the thing you should be doing, especially during these dips. Do not stack bananas. They go bad very rapidly. Who's stacking bananas? Max, I am surprised you don't remember. This is Mark Cuban, and you actually linked to the video on Twitter, and you uh, mocked him. But oh, the yeah. fact is, he said he would rather stack bananas than Satoshis. Right, and uh, that's a bad idea. You know, never stack bananas when you can stack Satoshis. That's, uh, I think, been proven convincingly now, year after year, decade after decade. Right. Well, you know what? There's another thing out there in the news this week. Uh, some Two items I want to call your attention to. The first is the, is the monolith in Utah, in the desert out in Utah. And now, you know, that whole area up there around outside of Vegas, Nevada, you know, Utah, so beautiful. Like we just have so much beauty in this country, in America. And it's just really stunning. Like if I could spend more time in the desert, I would spend more time in the desert because the desert is the place for me. Mm, I love the desert. I love putting my lizard on. Get the lizard, you know, heat coming down. I just lizard out. My lizard brain just kind of cooks and I'm totally at one with the solar energy. Right. And I also want to turn to another artist in the news this week. And I think in these times of global chaos and global depression and global uh, dark days of, of fiat and the dark ages of fiat from which we're emerging, I like to always have a little bit of a laugh and look at this little <laughs> clip of Anthony Hopkins. It's only like a few seconds long, but I had it on loop and I kept on watching it for hours earlier this week around uh, Thanksgiving. And, you know, I think he's, he's, you know, any artist who could bring either enlightenment, joy, smiles, like to your face, is okay by me. Oh, yeah. He's having a lot of fun, Anthony Hopkins, isn't he? What, Twitter's a great platform for that. You know, he understands that it's instant mass media and it's only memes and quick things are the best way to use it. And uh, he just pops it in there. It's great. Right. And... Then let's turn to Willie Wu because he was tweeting about these, um, you know, the 
it depends on where you were looking from, where you started buying, how long you've been involved in Bitcoin, what your uh, time horizon is and stuff like that. Some people are saying it's a crash. Some people saying it's a dip. Some people say it's the end of their world. And some people are, um, are, are super happy. Remember, I told you earlier um, in, in maybe the last episode or the one before of Orange Pill Podcast, I said, you know what? I, I'm like Warren Buffett. I don't like it when the price goes up like this because I, I'm able to get fewer Satoshis for my dollar cost averaging when I dollar cost average at swanbitcoin.com forward slash Stacy. And so I'm not getting as many Satoshis, but here's what he sees when he looks at the, the data, the chain analysis. Margin longs will be spanked until they go short. Bullishness was way overheated. Exchange flows are neutral. Spot sellers are matched with buyers. Fundamentals are great. The next few weeks, question mark, a great time to scoop cheap coins for 2021. He also noticed on chain as well that the last phase of the run to all-time high resistance was marked by small buyers, a class inrush of noob FOMO that was in 2017. That said, the rate of those new users coming last week was the highest we have seen in this bull cycle right up there with 2017 mania levels. So, you know, we've been talking about this here on Orange Pill Podcast. Certainly, you know, we have right here. Okay. And what we're seeing is that these, you know, big hedge funds like Paul Tudor Jones, like Stan Druckenmiller, they tend not to be as uh, panicky as a retail investor coming in with their $500 worth of Bitcoin. So, however, he's saying that in the last week, you did see a lot of those people coming into the sector. You, you probably saw that in the shitcoin market, where in the shitcoin market, we did see like some of those tiny, tiny coins with very little liquidity, small market caps. We saw them go up by up to 40, 50% in a day. And so that was the sign of the arrival of those retail traders, in my opinion. What do you think, Max? Mm, well, I look at it this way. Let's say you had a stock and the stock was trading at 19 and a half. And you look at it the next day, two days later, and it's trading at 17 and a half. Okay, what you what would be your reaction? Your reaction would be like, oh, okay, geez, um, that's not terribly interesting. And that's exactly what we saw. You know, Bitcoin went from nineteen and a half thousand to seventeen and a half thousand. Now it's uh, pushing eighteen thousand again. I mean, on a percentage basis, it's the exact same thing. It's meaningless. I mean, if you saw this on a nine, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen dollar stock. You, you wouldn't think twice about it. There's nothing to think about it, really. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a complete nothing burger, considering it's made the move from a dollar to 18,000, heading to 100,000. Uh, you know, we want volatility. Here's a point that I think gets overlooked. In exchange for volatility, we have unconfiscatable, censorship-proof, hard money. So there's a trade-off. You could have, Bitcoin could be right there at $1,000 of Bitcoin for 30 years and not move. And, um, you know, are you, would you write, would you prefer that which no volatility, but it would be confiscatable and it would be also censorable like you have with a dollar. Okay. That's, or would you be happy with that? Or would you take unconfiscatable, uncensorable money and it's going to be volatile as it moves up toward a hundred, 200, 300,000 a coin. So that's, that's, that's the question you have to ask yourself. They, they, you can't have zero volatility and unconfiscatable, uncensorable money. That does never going to happen. So, so if you, you know, that's it. I mean, so it's nothing. Right. You know, what has also hit a new all time high this past week was the S and P, the Dow, I guess it went through 30,000. So there was an exchange on Twitter and Okay, Danny Blanchfauer, he was a member of the Open Market Committee of the Bank of England. And the thing I like about him is that he's just like honest, like he's he's not one of these dishonest academics that um, pretend that they don't create the can tell in effect. Remember when I, I think it was Jerome Powell, Powell himself recently said that he sees no role in the Fed does not create inequality. Well, here is a, a an exchange that happened that I noticed online. And I want to repeat it for you and why, why we Bitcoin, why we're orange pilled and why the dark ages of fiat are over. Like this is the end of those dark ages and we should be celebrating, you, you know, sure there is chaos during the end days, but you know, we are, we are woke, <laughs> you know, we're ready for it. If you have a few Satoshis, you're ready for it. So what happened was Andrew Neal, 
who is a journalist there in the United Kingdom. He said, quote, I had dinner tonight with somebody who thinks he's a great market guru. Said it's mad Dow passed 30,000 in current circumstances. I said, no, equity prices reflect future, not past. 2021 will be a great rebound. I'm optimistic. UK stocks, especially underpriced. So, you know, he's like, right, there's going to be great economic activity. This is a great time to invest. You're going to go long the markets. So Danny Blanchflower honestly responded to him as such. Actually, stocks are mostly driven by global QE, which really has one major purpose, which is to raise asset prices. So again, like this is something that we've covered on Kai's report a few years ago when he jumped into a conversation I was having with that crazy woman, Francis Coppola, and she was denying that um, quantitative easing had anything to do with house prices increasing. And Danny Blanche Flower jumped in on my behalf and said, well, as somebody who voted for quantitative easing, I could tell you that that's what our intention was to cause house prices to rise. So here he's coming in again to people who are saying, wow, stock markets are rising because of all this economic activity. It's like the economy is going to boom. Things are great. And he's like, well, actually, it's the money printing that's causing this. This is what we wanted. Right. Well, two points. So first of all, as we covered a couple of weeks ago, when you take out the stock buybacks that are funded by money printing, the Dow Jones would be at 15,000, not 30,000. So that's a 50% difference. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, less than 10% of U.S. households own stocks. So all that money printing goes into the pockets of the few people that own stocks. So that's a prop. That's a political problem. And you have a lot of unrest in America and around the world for that very reason, not the Cantillon, Cantillon effect. And uh, number three, um, you know, this, uh, th th there's no connection between the economy and the stock market. So when Andrew Neal says, well, we anticipate uh, an economy doing such and such next year, that may or may not be true, but it has nothing to do with the stock market. There's, <laughs> there's no connection between, between the two. Um, as I just pointed out, without the money pumping and printing, stocks would be, down to 15,000 and earnings also for these big corporations would also be negative instead of being flat to slightly positive as a result of buying back their own stock. So it's a completely manufactured hallucination, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, driven by fiat money. And you say we're in the dark ages of fiat money. Okay. If that's mm -hmm. true. And of course it is true. Then this is an incredible bubble. The bond market is in a 300 year bubble. You know, I, I saw something about the UK. Their economy is having the worst quarter it's had in 300 years. They're the negative 11.5% print. It's the worst quarter in 300 years. Well, what's also been going on in incredibly for 300 years? Interest rates have never been as low as they are in the UK today in 300 years, mm. right? So th this is a multi multi-centennial phenomenon that we're experiencing. The bond market, the UK bond market and the global bond market is in the same thing in the US. Bond market in the US is at a 240 year bubble high. So these bonds are in multi hundred year highs. Interest rates are in multi hundred year lows. The economies like the UK are printing 300 year lows in terms of their collapse. And that collapse is driven by the money printing, which is destroying the tenants of free market capitalism and replacing it with neo-feudalism, as we've been talking about. So th those are the trends to keep in mind. Into this wasteland of stock buybacks, money printing, and economic collapse and fiat money collapse enters the heroic Bitcoin to clean up this mess. Right. And that's why we, I do call it the fiat dark ages. And like the first dark ages that ended with the Renaissance and during the last dark ages, it was the Catholic Church, which basically told humans that they were deplorables and that they had to rely on the authority of the church to uh, grant them access to heaven, to grant them access to knowledge. They could only know what the church allowed them to know. And part of it was through fear. And this is what um, how the Fiat Dark Ages has operated is that you kind of are kept in your place through the fear that you can't pay service your debt, for example. So you know, I think Bitcoin does offer a way out of that. It's offering a renaissance of, of possibility of what we can do as 
uh, people. And you can see that in our Orange Pill podcast group. There are nearly 7,000 people there. That's like a large town. That's a small city in the United States. Mm. So, And yet there's so much harmony. There's a few people who come in and whinge and cry and, you know, Karens and stuff like that occasionally. And they're easy to boot out. But I, I think it's it's pretty amazing that you can get 7,000 people from at least 100 different countries in the world and have so much um, interesting, deep uh, discourse. Yeah, because F Bitcoin is about peace and fiat money is about war. If the, if the group was focused on one of the fiat currencies, there would be constant bickering and violence in the group because fiat money breeds violence and war. Bitcoin breeds love and peace. And that's another reason why in, inherently within our DNA, within our spiritual beings, we gravitate toward Bitcoin because that's more of our natural state to be in harmony, not in discord. So the humans have tremendous potential, which has not been realized yet. There, as a matter of fact, there's a possibility of extinction because of the loss of habitat due to um, foolish destruction of the environment and that may may not make it but uh with bitcoin there is hope well i have a little bit more hope in humans i think uh you know we've faced almost eradication hundreds of times throughout history including the original humans that left africa because of the climate change brought on by the ice age which had sucked in all of the moisture in the atmosphere and caused famine and, and just desert across whatever parts of Africa were, you know, remained. And so they had to flee. But you know what? With that, I want to go to another interesting mind expanding mind, uh, the possibilities of human and what we could do in this interview that we did with Brandon Quidham. And um, I think I like it. Yeah, let's do it. So this is Orange Pill Podcast interview with Brandon Quidham. He's from swanbitcoin.com, and he's written an amazing piece called Bitcoin and the Rhythms of History. Brandon, welcome to Orange Pill. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here, Max and Stacey. Yeah, I love this piece, Bitcoin and the Rhythms of History, because it just kind of plugs your mind into the bigger picture here. Does so elegantly, well-written. And uh, one thing I love about this space is that it's brought out everyone's best uh, kind of um, when it comes to writing and philosophy and things, you know, people haven't been thinking about for years. It's all coming to the top. It's all coming together. You know, Max and I had first heard about the fourth turning quite a few years ago uh, from uh, Michael Krieger, who was talking about it. At the time, I thought it was pretty wacky, <laughs> but then... Now that, you know, a few years later into Bitcoin and the Bitcoin drawing in like a black hole more and more of the financial universe, you're starting to really understand it. So let's go into the fourth turning because it started in 2008, 2009, right when Bitcoin actually was born. So Bitcoin seemed to be born at the right time that it was actually needed. Um, so for the audience that doesn't know about the fourth turning, just explain what these 90 year cycles are and where we are in that cycle right now. Yeah, absolutely. So the fourth turning is a book written in the late 90s, and it was written by two historians who are really into demography or studying generational cycles. And what they found through a long history is that society doesn't advance linearly like we might think it does. Instead, it advances in these predictable 80 to 90 year cycles and this is really useful for looking at, you know, kind of a zoomed out view of society and looking at these major trends, like how is our civic engagement? How do we view institutions? Do we trust them or do we not? Are we supportive of individualism or collectivism? So very broad strokes. And the current cycle we're in started in 1945. And the beginning of these 80, 90 year cycles are defined by periods of strong institutions, weak individualism. This is the 1950s, Pax Americana, white picket fences. And then halfway through that cycle, we hit the second turning, which is called an awakening. And this is when those strong institutions from the 50s get attacked in the name of personal and spiritual autonomy. And this is led by the boomers in that, in that recent period. And that's where we totally changed the interior world. This is religious uprisings throughout history. They were always in that second turning. And then in the early 80s, we transitioned into the unraveling or the third turning. And this is defined by weak institutions and rising individualism. We see things like deregulation, culture wars, 
and finances are still going okay. Um, we start to see the decay, but there's really no motivation to change. And then we transition into the fourth turning, like you mentioned, that was the beginning of the global financial crisis. That was sort of the turning point. And what that means is that our institutions have fully decayed, we know they're a problem, and society realizes, wow, we actually need some sort of institutions in society to keep our culture, to keep our organizations going. And so that's defined by tearing down all the old institutions, and usually because of a perceived threat. So historically, war mobilizes the people. We totally change all the external institutions, socio-political economics, and it becomes a new founding point, a founding moment in American history, and it radically redefines our national identity. And so we're right in the middle of that fourth turning now. I don't think we've hit the climax quite yet, but we can look back to a period between 1929 to 1945. That's our best analog for guidance. And so expect volatility, expect conflict, um, expect a rising tide of uh, collectivism, which is quite scary for Bitcoiners. But the young generations, the millennials, they're collectivists. We see all these problems and they think it's important that we band together to make wide sweeping change. It's also a time when we flirt with populism, totalitarianism. And so, yeah, it's an important point to pay attention and there will be winners and losers and I just implore everyone to kind of take a deep breath and see where we're at in deep history. Right. You know, talking about cycles and history, and on one hand, it sounds uh, pretty uh, historically easy to prove cycles. On the other hand, uh, people are resistant to accept maybe the fact that, oh, you know, we're kind of locked into a cycle. You know, the fact is that the planets are orbiting in very predictable cycles and that we always use business cycles and we use seasonal cycles and we're always using cycles. Uh, but on, it can get to the point of the banal if you talk about, let's say, astrology, right? Astrology tries to codify certain cycles and you end up with uh, something that doesn't have much uh, cre credence, you know, going forward. Uh, and then you have, you know, astronomy, which is the opposite of that, right? It's like, oh, this is actually, we can build Stonehenge and the sun will come up at this exact pot every year at this exact moment, right? So we're trapped in between these two things. Do you think it's, my question is this, do you think it's human nature to reject the cyclical nature of things out of, out of hand? And that's part of the problem. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a good point. So first off, looking at history, there's a lot of data to, to, to search through. And if we're trying to do some sort of analysis on our past, it's very easy to succumb to a confirmation bias. We look for exactly the point in history that we want to then extrapolate to the future. So again, always important to do that. And the second point you mentioned is, do humans reject these cycles? And the answer is yes. Humans think that we are sort of evolved out of nature. We are this mega brain that no longer is succumb to the petty whims of biological evolution. We've evolved past it. We're sort of these big brain gods. And so we reject it. But the reality is that we're just monkeys with fancy clothes and ability to plan for the future. And so I, I fundamentally reject the idea that humans are above nature. I think we're firmly ingrained in it. Yes, we are unique. Um, but the important thing here is that things like history, the economy, um, biology in general, evolution, these are complex adaptive systems. And I don't believe that humans actually have the ability to understand these things. For example, we look at our DNA and up until very recently, we assumed that 98% of our DNA was junk DNA. We literally called it junk DNA because we weren't aware what it was used for. And of course, we didn't know what it was for, so we assume it's junk. When in reality, biology has billions of years of iterations and things that are around today are around for a reason. And so I think we can extrapolate that also to our economy. You have the central banker class, the central planning class, and they fundamentally believe as the big brain monkeys that they are, that they can drive the ship. They can understand the economy and make calculated changes. But what that leads to is all these unintended consequences, simply because it's a complex adaptive system and individual monkey brains cannot understand it. And so Bitcoin fundamentally rejects the concept of central planning and says it's not possible for humans. Instead, we create this rigid structure that sort of is the foundation of society. And then we let the individuals go about their, ba their ways. And I think that's just a better, a better way to approach economics. And it's a humbling perspective. 
Right. So to pick up on that, you're talking about this confirmation bias that humans seem to uh, succumb to. It's also the basis for Greek tragedy, you know, going back to uh, 2,700 years ago that um, there is a uh, seem to be a certain fatalistic quality to humans to go fly into the sun, you know, and uh, this type of thing. But in the Bitcoin protocol, uh, Brandon, you know, there's something like the, the difficulty adjustment, which which kicks in every two weeks. It seems as though it's trying to get us to overcome ourselves. And so this is always fascinating to me about this protocol in that it seems to know us better than we know ourselves. Therefore, are we really ultimately the ones that designed this thing? You know, and then, it, you know, we go off into a bit of a f philosophical tangent, I'm sure. But I guess my, my question to keep it simple would be the difficulty adjustment and then the halvings that happen every four years. Is this kind of a way to overcome this confirmation bias and to have humans do something that maybe um, they were incapable of doing by themselves. What do you think? Yeah, really good point. So I, I would look at history with this and the example I would point to is that anytime humans were in control of the monetary supply, eventually we become corrupted for some reason and we take advantage of our privilege. And then what we do is we debase the currency for political wills. And you make a very astute observation that what Bitcoin does is it takes away the power of money production. That monopoly is no longer in the hands of humans. And instead, we outsource it to a predictable protocol. And the difficulty adjustment, one of the most fascinating parts of Bitcoin, is that perfect governor that prevents the production to be uh, brought into new Bitcoins being minted at a rate that is exceeding the pre-programmed schedule. And so, for example, to make this point tangible, let's say we feel that Bitcoin's valuable. And today we, we point all the energy production on our planet towards mining Bitcoin. What will happen? Okay, for the next two weeks, we will mine a ton more Bitcoin, let's say 10 times more Bitcoin than we should have for a two week period. And then right when the difficulty adjustment kicks in, now all of a sudden, um, it's going to be way harder to produce those Bitcoins and we're right back on schedule. And so, like you said, it prevents human greed and human instinct from uh, co-opting the protocol. It's very elegant. Right. And the miners who are constantly faced with capital expense and expanding their capacity, et cetera, even if that suddenly had a burst of production, they wouldn't necessarily buy into it because they know that the difficulty adjustment will take them right back to a more predictable output anyway. So that keeps the capback expense in check as well. Stacy. Right. Um, let's uh, c continue on with these cycles because we're talking about that fourth turning and that we're in the middle of that now. We also have been talking on our various programs about the Thucydides trap. And this is a, another huge cycle that happens throughout history, 18 times throughout history of a rising power, so, you know, surpassing a, a, a sinking power. So we're in that at the same time that we're in this, you know, fourth turning in the United States. Now, in 1929 to 1945 was kind of also a Thucydides trap as well in that the British Empire was falling and the American Empire was uh, rising. Um, so meet that because, you know, back in the 1980s when, when uh, The Fourth Turning was written by Neil Howe and William Strauss, they wrote then that sometimes before the year 2025, America will pass through a great gate in history commensurate with the American Revolution, Civil War, and the twin emergencies of the Great Depression and World War II. So those are pretty seismic events that they're saying, these are the last four or five years that we're entering now of this fourth turning. We have the Thucydides trap. And bizarrely, on top of this, we've elected a president who was born before this cycle began. So he's older than born in 1945. He's born in like 1942 or 43. So this is pretty crazy that we've elected a guy from a previous cycle at the end of the previous cycle, born in the last few years of that previous cycle, um, who kind of has cognitive decline as well. So like put all of these together into one thing and like it could be pretty, this could be a one for the history books of fourth turning, which are pretty historic in themselves. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point as well. And a couple points to point to touch on here. Number one, uh, we're halfway through the fourth turning and we haven't hit the, the crisis or the um, peak yet. 
And so what that means is that in the next five, 10 years, a lot is going to happen. And you can rewind to the late 30s. Um, let's say 1940, 1939, 1938, somewhere in there, uh, pre-World War II, right? It's just a recovering from the Great Depression period. Uh, we just instituted social security, pensions, unemployment insurance, FDIC. We're trying to get the economy back on uh, with the New Deal. And then, we, and then in 1941, we go to World War II. And then in 1944, we go through Bretton Woods, 1945, 1946. Now we're in this Pax Americana period. And what happened there? We went through a giant global war. We went through a period of uh, re-architecting the exterior world through Bretton Woods, World Bank, IMF, NATO, um, all these mega institutions that pretty much set uh, a new course for American history. And so uh, that's where we're at now. We haven't hit the peak yet. And then you mentioned these other cycles, very important. So we have the long-term credit cycle popularized by Ray Dalio. That's coming to a head. The Thucydides cycle you mentioned. We also have the sovereign individual, which is a slower, more gradual change to the information age. So the logic of violence is changing. The mega nation state is uh, less powerful or less useful in this information age world. And we have the fourth turning for the first time ever synced up globally. So after Bretton Woods, we're starting to notice that the whole world's on this dollar standard, then the petrodollar standard. We're seeing populism rise all over the place. China is displaying some fourth turning tendencies. And so it's very concerning to me that the whole world is in a fourth turning. And that could mean larger fireworks. Um, I'm not sure. Historically, that would be true. We'd lead to total war. However, I do hold a little bit of optimism for Bitcoin coming in here because it can serve as this life raft. It's sort of a pressure release valve that both saves the individual because you can get off the dying ship and put your capital into this other system, also at the business level, also at the state level. If you see what's coming, you don't like the dollar hegemony, fine, move a little capital to Bitcoin. And if that's true, you'll reduce some of the suffering and fewer people will be desperate, which could lead to less conflict globally. Right. So, Brand Brandon, I heard something there. I wanted to pick up on it. You said, in, in reference to individual sovereignty, you also used this phrase, the logic of violence. And I think I know where you're going with that, but I, it's an interesting turn of phrase. I, I think you, you maybe dig into this a little bit, if you can. Yeah, absolutely. So this comes directly out of the, the book, The Sovereign Individual. And one of the main theses there in that book is about the logic of violence. And what that essentially says is over time, um, there's different sort of incentives related to violence that lead to power. Um, and so a concrete example would be, we're currently in the nation state period of this industrial revolution, where the guy with the largest army, the most magnitude for violence has control over the planet. This is the US with our aircraft carriers everywhere and military bases everywhere. That's advantageous in an industrial era. You wanna trade and you wanna defend your trade routes essentially and you tax everyone in the process. Now, as we enter the information age, that all of a sudden changes. You don't need these giant militaries everywhere because all of a sudden offense becomes more expensive than defense. So you just flip that around. And, what that, and that comes from things like uh, encryption. So encrypted communications, encrypted money and things like that. And so what that leads to is a slow trend towards smaller nation states and a little bit more defensive structures. And optimistically, these nation states will treat their citizens more like customers because capital can move, you, you do most of your economic output online, so geography is not as important. And so now nation states will hopefully be competing for our business, our capital, our output, and that would lead to a fracturing of these mega states into smaller city states. And I think that's a better approach for humanity. We can go where we're, we're most wanted and where we would like to be. And theoretically, it would reduce uh, global war because you don't really get much from creating a war. It's better to trade. And, you know, it just changes the incentives there. Now, it doesn't mean there won't be tyranny in the world. Of course, there will be. However, it will be much less, uh, it'll be much more expensive to tyrannize. Well, we often on Orange Pill Podcast talk about the first renaissance. We believe we're in a renaissance 2.0. And you had a lot of competition between the city-states there. That's how you ended up with a city-state like Florence attracting the best artists in the world is like they had the choice of going to Milan or Venice and Rome or you know anywhere else in what was uh, Italy at that time. 
But it also came on the end of a very difficult time. You had the dark ages of the Catholic Church, but you also had the bubonic plague. You had Inquisition. You had all of this stuff. So, I mean, it, it might seem horrible. A lot of stuff might seem horrible, but amazing, epoch-changing, historic sort of innovations and art and thinking could emerge from it, or, or, well, most likely because of the hard, hard times create good, strong people, right? So uh, elaborate on that and what you think of that. Yeah, definitely. That's a really important point. In order to have these periods of great prosperity in human civilization, it almost always comes after a really dark period. And there's a lot of reasons why that could be, um, but I, I think it's more important just to look at where we are. And we're in that dark period now. It's going to get darker, but this doesn't mean we should succumb to nihilism. It means that there are greater days ahead and what we do today matters. And these fourth turnings, they don't always end up in a, a triumphant victory. Sometimes they're kind of tragic, like the end of the Civil War. And so I think it's important that we're heads down, we're focused and we're building the future. And to tie it to present time, um, during fourth turnings, what needs to happen is we rally the troops, we tear down the old institutions, and we build new. And combined with a failing financial system, even worse than we had in the previous fourth turning. And so I see two major problems in society. One, society demands order and stability, which we get from institutions, and we currently have very little. Number two, our financial system's failing, and we somehow need to replace it. And Bitcoin's actually an answer to both of these problems. I see Bitcoin as a strong institution that provides order and stability so the people can rally around it. They can uh, latch on to this thing that creates order. And it's also a new financial system. And so Bitcoin fits perfectly in here. And I also think it's unique in a sense uh, through deep history because it's a sturdier foundation simply because it's not managed by individuals. And institutions run by individuals decay over time, as we mentioned, they're easy to change, et cetera. And what, what happens is when humans are in control, it leads to inter interventionism and protectionism, which feels good in the short term. However, it simply just suppresses volatility, it hides the risk, and that leads to greater meltdown. And anytime we have financial crisis, it actually makes inequality worse. And so that's not going to do the trick. You can look at 08, you can look at 2020, we're consolidating the big business at the expense of the little guy. Um, however, Bitcoin is different, right? It is a protocol controlled by the people. It's built for a thousand years, not an 80 year cycle. And it's resistant to attack and change. And it, interestingly, it accepts the short term volatility, which is displayed in its price. Um, but at the same time, it's not hiding that risk. And so all that risk is being cycled through the system. And what that gives us is systemic stability. Okay, that's a massive change. And I think that this is a sturdy foundation that humanity can rebuild in a renaissance type way. Um, it sort of solved the hard problem, which is taking politics out of money. And to me, this is the most important next step for humanity. It's on the order of any of our great inventions. It creates this strong foundation that which we can build much higher because of it. Right, right. I'm sensing a bit of a paradox here. Let me explain. So uh, Clinton ended Glass-Steagall. That was put into place in 1933 in response to the banking fraud that had led to the crash. Roosevelt turned to Keynesianism. And now young people are demanding student debt forgiveness and MMT. And so we see the history rhyming there and we see the cycles in play and we see the money printing. But as you allude to, there's a bit of optimistic note. You've got Bitcoin as a wild card. You know, is this a fifth turning? I mean, is this going to shatter the mold? Are we is this a pathway out of the mess? Good question. And this is probably the most common question I hear from Bitcoiners. A funny quick aside is that when I first read the book, I viewed it through my nice orange tinted glasses and I thought, wow, Bitcoin is going to totally disrupt human uh, cycles. And then I spent more time with the material and I realized that it, it's not going to disrupt the cycles. Um, these cycles are deeply emergent human things based on human families and being around other humans. And we just can't stop it. It's things like you rebel against your parents and it, it's just that fundamental. And so how I see Bitcoin playing in is it might reduce the volatility in these cycles. If you think of a sine wave, it's just going to compress that wave, which I think is, is better for humanity because those blow off tops cause all kinds of problems. And so I, I just see it as a volatility dampener. And 
that will reduce waste and, and sort of lead us to higher economic growth over time. Right. Well, let's uh, continue on that sort of path because, you know, with humans, because we have consciousness and language, there are cycles all the way down. There's so many cycles. There's, like you said, the, the family structure one where the child rebels against the parent. There's the generational ones, the multi, the four generation cycle. There's the more epochal one of the Thucydides trap that can last hundreds of years. Um, but, you know, it really, mo you know, humans didn't really, we've been around for a long time, but we didn't really start writing down our history and understanding these cycles. So is there bound to be a bit of reflexivity in it? You know, <laughs> that once you could see the cycles and once you know, oh, it's overbought now, then everybody uh, starts to sell because they don't want to have an overbought situation or an oversold or, you know, the, the, you know, George Soros always, always talked about reflexivity in the market. So once we're aware, if we're, if we're so aware of like the fourth turning and what happens, like, is it just inevitable or if, if we uh, tell everybody, if we tell all the millennials and Generation Z, don't do this? Yeah, interesting point. Yeah, it's kind of a, an emergent mar or an efficient market hypothesis applied to these demographic cycles, which I think is absolutely hilarious. Um, but there is some truth to that, right? Once humans observe a cycle, um, we do push back on it. There's a symbiotic relationship between the individuals and history. And that's actually what creates this cycle. And so um, to illustrate something from the, the book there, I think that you can summarize the book as history creates generations, generations create history. And what that means is everyone's born, let's say we're all millennials, we're all born at the same time, history imprints a sort of fingerprint on us based on the time that we were, we were born. We all grew up together in that time period, then we become adults, and you can sort of generalize this group which all grew up the same. So we're gonna react the same when we become adults. And then we start pushing back on history and changing history, which then influences the next generation. And so I think it is uh, deeply human like that, but we do change the cycle when we're aware of it. However, um, I think it's such a zoomed out broad trend that it doesn't matter that all of us individually are anomalies or that 10% of the world observes the cycle. I think it has to do with these individual archetypes that we can't really stray away from that much. And so these archetypes, each generation has an archetype and the constellation of those archetypes, you know, is the idealistic one in charge or are they the old, you know, the young people? Is the um, collectivist in charge or are they still children? Right, so the constellation of those archetypes dictates the mood, and that's what dictates the the response to catalysts. And so I'm hesitant to say the efficient market hypothesis here applies too much, but there is definitely symbiosis. Yeah, in your piece, Bitcoin and the rhythms of history, you know, you take that, um, you know, you, you break it down into different generations are in charge at different times, and then the next, which generation is in waiting, et cetera. And you build the whole story up like this. And that's, I think, what makes that piece so fascinating. Um, you know, it's gotten a lot of circulation, your piece. What's been the, you know, you talked a little bit about what, what people have reacted to it and asked you questions about it. What, what's the overall feeling about that you've gotten, the feedback you've gotten to the piece? Uh, you know, it's going into a community of Bitcoiners primarily. Um, you know, they are coming in from all different fields, all different uh, schools and things. What, what's been the reaction? And it did, has it surprised you at all? What's been the most surprising reaction you've gotten since this piece went out? Because it has circulated quite widely. Yeah, definitely. So initial feedback was very positive. I've, I've gotten hundreds of messages saying it was the most mind blowing thing they've ever read. Um, that's one cohort. Now, you also have a cohort that says, I fundamentally reject these cycles because you can't make such broad sweeping generalizations. And usually the premise of that argument, at least my assessment of the argument, is that number one, technology is too powerful. And so they would rate technology as a stronger driver than these human archetypal generational cycles. That's one. And the other one is, well, my big brain says that um, this time is different and every time is different throughout history. And so I would say there's those two camps. And to the technology people who think that technology is more powerful, um, you know, that's a reasonable approach, but I, I think there's another angle here, which is that the mood at the time determines what demand 
there is for technology. And that demand through this mood is observed by entrepreneurs, which leads to technology in the future. And so they're coming at it from two different ways. I don't think either, either direction, either technology, economics versus generations, I don't think either one's perfect, but I think it's important to realize that these cycles are very deep. They produce a mood, which then gets produced into the future. And one concrete example would be Facebook. Um, this is a millennial driven phenomenon. Gen X would probably find Facebook in its early days to be completely insane as the individualistic generation. Millennials are like, we're all the same, um, no problem, let's put everything on the internet. And so that is very much a millennial driven change. And if you didn't have millennials driving the Facebooks of the world, maybe we wouldn't have produced those in the first place because there wouldn't have been a demand for it. I hope that makes sense. Right. You know, we come back to 2008 because that was the financial crisis. That's when Bitcoin was born. That's also that financial crisis was the first election that millennials really participated in. And they came out in force for Obama. And Obama, interestingly, Matt Stoller, who does amazing work on anti-monopoly stuff, he, um, he said this was the equivalent of during the Great Depression when the people, like the people basically in 2008 chose Herbert Hoover over FDR. So they made the bad choice. They made the choice of Obama, who was an amazing orator, like historic in terms of how amazing he was as, at, at public speaking, but he chose the corrupt banking system. He chose not to burn it down. He chose to keep it propped up beyond what it was. So I know, I mean, a lot of these four turnings end in just all out physical war of people killing each other, but in a way, you know, that was a choice of a financial class war that he chose and that we're still going through. Uh, look at the opioid overdoses in America. We look at the decline in the mortality rate. I mean, that, the, the fact that the mortality rate is going down, that the first time in peacetime in America suggests actually maybe it is wartime. So maybe there has been a different sort of war. Yeah, I think that's interesting to bring up Obama here. And Obama was, uh, again, in 2008, that's the transition period between third and fourth. And what we see in fourth turnings is civic engagement skyrocketing as the millennials, the hero archetype come of age and start voting, like you mentioned. However, Obama was sort of a transition president. He had one foot in the, in the third turning and one, ter one foot in the fourth turning. And an interesting parallel between the two is in the third turning, politicians hide all the problems and they say, no problem, you know, it's not a big deal. They, they minimize them. And that's simply because there's no demand for change in the third turning. Now in the fourth turning, people all of a sudden realize, probably spurred by the global financial crisis, that, holy shit, we really need some change. And so then what you see is politicians weaponizing the fact that there's a demand for change and they come up with slogans like hope and change, make America great again, drain the swamp. Those are all pushing on that pain and, and saying, look, I'm the guy to make the change. And so that's a really interesting analogy. And Obama certainly uh, said one thing and did another. And that's pretty frustrating to see. And now that we're in uh, sort of the peak of the fourth turning, historically, what we need is a, quote, gray champion. This is someone who's a little bit older. They are molded by the situation. It's someone you might not expect. FDR was this person in the 30s, whether or not we want to criticize him. Um, but he's something that young people rally around and has tremendous popular support. So his election in, in 32, it was the most popular uh, vote of all time. And so that's sort of the sign. And I don't see that with Joe Biden and I don't see that with Trump. And so from a political standpoint, I'm not sure who, sure who our great champion is going to be. That's sort of one of the, the down facing cards we've yet to flip over in this fourth turning. Right. I mean, you could argue that it would have been Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. but uh, through a lot of uh, questionable machinations in the political circles, he did not take his place. So they, it's been a, the, the cyclical, the grand cycle has been thwarted. And the results, you know, could be a, de a derailment, I guess. I mean, that's part of the fourth turning is that you, the thing comes off the rails and it just, there's no, and, and you have this horrible, horrible historical moment. And maybe looking back, they'll say, well, had that not been the case and there was 
this guy got through. This was uh, uh, when when history wasn't served, and we ended up with this terrific thing. And it was either part of the turnings or, you know, it's fascinating stuff. So anyway, I mean, I'm going to read it again. I've read the whole thing twice now. I'll probably read it, you know, every few months. I'll return to it just to know, like, where I am, because otherwise I'd be totally lost. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being on here. This was uh, really, uh, again, we like mind-blowing conversation uh, to expand our minds, prepping us for this burning down, the combustion of the old system, because, it, you know, there's no use holding on to it. It's over. It's, it's gone. The, the dark ages are over. Enlightenment is here. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for this. That was a blast. <sighs> Right. I like all of these young thinkers and these sort of kids entering the space. Kids, in my mind, you know, they're adults, though. But, you know, mm. big, big thinkers, you know, Bitcoin always delivers what is needed at the time. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Bitcoin has created a generation of philosophers, which is interesting because it's not something people were interested in before Bitcoin. I'm, I'm going to make that generalization, but I think it's true because, you know, you're attracted to Bitcoin for different reasons. And then once you start thinking about it, it starts to get you thinking about what it means to be thinking, right? And this is what the basis of philosophy is, how to think about thinking. And it, this is what Bitcoin does. And so, yeah, you hear younger generations talking about all this stuff and uh, it's very inspiring. Right, because a lot of people are, are, you know, new to the space, but they're asking, like, is this at all like 2017? And in 2017, you had a lot of ICOs, all the altcoin, shitcoin markets were booming. We had loads of these big Bitcoin, you know, crypto conferences. They weren't, there weren't very many Bitcoin conferences in 2017. And what you saw were young guys driving Lambos and in the New York Times talking about how much money they had and blah, 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 where you don't have any of that at all. Even somebody like, say, Michael Saylor, if, if his coins between um, micro strategies and his own personal stash are over a billion dollars now, it's not like, you know, he's like driving a Lambo and like uh, pictured with chicks all over. Like that's not the sort of state we are in at the moment as we were back in 2017 as a community. Obviously, individuals were uh, not necessarily like that. But as a community, the, the, the how we were perceived by the mainstream was that it was all Lambos and you know, dudes at, at crypto conferences going to strip clubs. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But that's unpredictable, you know, that um, the use case for wealth at that time, the first generation to make millions and maybe even a billion in Bitcoin uh, would be to splurge on the very obvious um, manifestations or uh, conspicuous consumption, yes. this, as it's called, with the when Lambo meme. And we don't have that right now for a couple of reasons. Number one, people are like, if I spend 250,000 on a Lambo now and Bitcoin goes up 40 to 80 X, that Lambo will have been quite expensive at the end of the day. I'm not sure I want to do that. Uh, number two, you know, when you go from Bitcoin back to Lambo, that means you're going from Bitcoin back to fiat money. So you're putting fiat money back into the system. And for this revolution to succeed, we need as much, we need to defund fiat, defund the state. So you need to put as much away into unconfiscatable Bitcoin as possible. Uh, so you need to keep draining that swamp of fiat. What do you think also, it just struck me that a kind of a comparison to uh, the internet. So in the early internet days in the 90s, you had people like John Barry, John Perry Barlow as Sean Ono Lennon had mentioned on our last episode of Orange Pill Podcast, and he wrote the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. I think that was in the early 90s that he wrote that, maybe in the late 80s even. But, you know, it was very idealistic in those early days, and it was mostly the cypherpunks and coders and, and people who had access to early, like, DARPA net and stuff like that. So you had to be kind of already like a coder sort of geek guy to even get access in the early days and have already developed those mailing lists and stuff like that. So I went from there then to the late 90s that we all know as the dot-com bubble. And it was the same, a similar thing. It was like all about the Lambos and the CEOs and all these young, like 22-year-olds minting themselves a fortune on these um, stock IPOs. And and then that collapsed. And then then... Then we got back down to business and the internet 
especially connecting people around the world, the, the value of that started to um, build. Right. Well, the cypherpunks never went away. So the cypherpunks were there in the 90s, and John Perry Barlow was a hero to the cypherpunks. And you had the dot-com boom and insta-billionaires and the CEO wearing the plastic pants <laughs> was, a, was an iconic image of that era. And it blew up around 2001. The cypherpunks continued. So the cypherpunks eventually succeeded in what they were trying to do for decades, and that was to disrupt money itself, to solve the double-spend problem. And in so doing, they've created a permanent change, not just a temporary boom and bust. This is a fundamental permanent once-in-a-thousand-year change that the cypherpunks engineered put together. And it's interesting also, you talk about the philosophers in Bitcoin and how the next generation is perceiving things to be in this philosophical way. They're also rejecting a lot of people who come at it from purely the number goes up and the trading mentality. Some of the hedge fund guys who are not articulate, not very good in expressing the bigger picture here and in it just for a trade, they're being rejected. You know, they're being like, you know, you're just in it for the quick bucks. You're a tourist, essentially, in this mm. space. And thank you for the buying power, but we don't need to hear what you have to say. Right. I mean, what would the Renaissance have been if it were, you know, if there were, you know, a Soho or Chelsea sort of scene, Manhattan scene at the time, whereby, you know, Da Vinci and Michelangelo and Botticelli and Titian and these guys were just like, you know, meaningless, frivolous celebrities who were being pictured in the tabloids and not something else driving them to communicate something about the magnificence of, of man, of humans, you know, the beauty of humans that had been hidden through the dark ages and, and knowledge of philosophy of the Greeks and classical um, architecture and art and, and the gods, you know, so what, what, what if they had been bimbos who were just interested in uh, wearing plastic pants and driving Lambos? Well, you know, you talk about the Renaissance and of course he brings you back to Florence and he brings you to the house of Medici and they, of course, introduced the florin, which was the uh, leaps and bounds, the best currency anyone had seen for quite some time. And that was the foundation upon which the creativity could thrive because the foundation was sound. So their, their daily movements in the economy were not completely stressed out where things are constantly changing. There's hyperinflation. Everything's devaluing or un inflating, uh, and, and there's no standards. And that's, that's so stressful that you don't have the leisure, if you will, to create, to be a da Vinci, uh, because the economy is so screwed up and you're struggling horribly. So once uh, de Medici put in the florin and you had that stability that comes with this, then the arts thrived and uh, the arts thrived. And of course they inspire people to do creative stuff, which ends up creating businesses, which ends up creating GDP growth, which ends up creating demand for the florin and mm. end up creating demand at the house of Medici. So, you know, it's a self uh, fulfilling prophecy. It's a symbiotic relationship. The artistic spiritual side and the sound money side go together, you know, quite brilliantly and, and they emphasize and, and, and build on each other. I might add as well, like if you think about that, that period to here is at that time, you did need a Lorenzo de Medici, right? He was powerful and very wealthy. So could stand up to the Vatican, who was all powerful at the time. The Vatican did send in armies and try to have him killed. So, I mean, it was like a dangerous time that the Vatican did... Um, they it, it um, excommunicated the whole city of Florence, and and that was actually something that meant something to the people there, and it was very uh, stressful situation for Medici to even be to because of him to have the whole town the city excommunicated. Right. Whereas, so you needed that guy to be strong and stand up to the Pope, and it's I mean it uh, it would have been understandable had he not. But now we don't even need that. Like the dark ages now is overseen by the, the fiat system and the Vatican is the, um, the central banking system. But Bitcoin, there's no, you know, there is Satoshi, but he's anonymous and, or they or she, nobody knows who Satoshi is. So there's no one person that needs to stand firm. It's this, it's this network, peer-to-peer -peer network around the world that will always stay strong against the onslaught. Right. So the uh, House of Medici had to take on the Pope and the Pope had an army and the Pope would send out his army. And 
Medici and Florence had an army, or they would uh, form alliances with other states that had stronger armies, I guess, in Venice or whatever. And, they, and so this was a constant tension. Now, today, you're right that the new uh, papacy, the new Vatican, would be the central bank. And, and, the, and Bitcoin is the new uh, house of Medici. Uh, the difference is that the central bank still, as they did in the Middle Ages, rely on violence and coercion. Yes. And the new house of uh, Medici, with empowered not by the florin, but by Bitcoin, doesn't need violence, doesn't need coercion, because it's unconfiscatable. I mean, in the old days, in the Middle Ages, you could come and take your gold, right? They had Their, their gold was stored in, in, in uh, Florence, and yeah, in, in there was a, a vault, and they had the gold, and sometimes, you know, they had to defend that gold. But if you have unconfiscatable billions on your private key, and there's no way you can violently take them, then the old guard, which could be the Federal Reserve Bank slash papacy, they are at loggerheads. They can't do anything about it. So now we have this first time ever where pure creativity, pure spiritual energy can, can be freed, can just be free. We don't know where that's going to go. That's the amazing thing. Like if you were to allow humanity's spiritual energy free to roam as it wants to, we, we don't know where that can, what's going to happen. I'm really curious. I mean, we're going to know in the next couple of years, but what is that going to mean? Right. And well, let's uh, look at that moment as an opportunity to go to, you know, some Abe Cambridge of the sunexchange.com forward slash orange pill and look at, you know, the realm of possibility out there. There is no spoon. I was a bit disappointed by a bit of news I discovered this week. A couple of months ago, they discovered potential signs of life on the planet of Venus. A very complex um, chemical called phosphine was detected in the upper atmospheres, a chemical only to have believed to have been able to be produced by life or in a complex laboratory. Unfortunately, it was actually a data measurement area. No phosphine is actually in the atmosphere of Venus. But that does not mean our hunt for life in our solar system other than Earth is over because the Cassini spacecraft, which launched a probe onto Saturn's moon of Titan, has discovered complex organic chemistry. This organic chemistry really is the precursor to life. So the questions we have to ask ourselves, is panspermia possible? Is life on Earth because the same chemicals that flew through our solar system did the same chemicals reach various other planets and it's only really on our planet has intelligent life progressed. Because let's face it, the existence of life and the existence of intelligent life are very, very different things. So what are the chances of intelligent life existing elsewhere in our galaxy? And to answer that, you can just go to the Drake Equation. Now, the Drake Equation looked at the probability of life being developed on a planet and then the probability of that life becoming intelligent. Now, the best estimate that the equation gives is that there is between 1,000 and 100,000 civilizations in our galaxy. Now, the bad news is that the average distance apart between these civilizations is 17,000 light years. So by the time they receive a communication from us and they return a communication, that's a 34,000 year round trip. Now, bearing in mind that no civilization on Earth has yet existed for more than a few thousand years, it really shows us that we have to pull our socks up and become a sustainable civilization that can live within the confines and limitations of our planet to be able to survive for long enough to be able to communicate with another civilization. And if we want to start spending space probes to these other civilizations, we better come up with some better ways of getting there because now the best ways of traveling around our solar system are limited but we have got one very cool one that's coming up and I'll tell you about it in the next video. Right. He's left us on a cliffhanger there. Well, I mean, this is a great question and uh, I have the answer. Okay, give us the answer, oh, Max Kaiser. Well, he talks about 17,000 light years being the average distance between what potentially a thousand and a hundred thousand 
civilizations or intelligent life and that communication, therefore, is impeded by this distance. But here's, you know, my I'm working on this for a number of years, though, and I've told you about it as well. So human brains are at the point now of becoming networked and the global unconscious becoming into the hive mind. And I believe that within the human mind, there is part of it that has yet to be tapped by any human or by our species in any way. It's a, it's like that monolith that they found in the desert. Mm. Uh, they discovered this thing and they're not sure what it is. Is it put there by aliens? Whatever. We have within our mind a, a portion of it. And the mind is still enormously undiscovered. It's still a, kind of a blank page. We there There is a port that will... Uh, manifest itself once the global telecommunications hive is in place to a sufficient degree, then this will become active. And when it becomes active, then communication with these other intelligent life forms around the multiverse will, will, will become active. It's like you install a telephone line into your home and then the phone starts to ring, right? Uh, without that line being connected to the network, you would not have that ability to speak to somebody 3,000 miles away or 9,000 miles away or in outer space once the network is connected. Once the network is in place, and we're coming to that moment very rapidly in our experience, then communication with all these other civilizations will just be turned on like a switch. Imagine having to watch a news broadcast, you know, where you see sometimes like a three second um, gap. <laughs> and right. that's a horrible one, but imagine 17,000 years. So I'm going to ask this guy from uh, planet X from Galic at the edge of the galaxy, you know, but what, the way you get around cool? the time lag, though, is through synchronicity. Yeah. So the synchronicity, the fact is, I'm saying through the hive mind, yeah. as long as the brain can communicate, process information within the mind, it can process information within the multiversal mind. And so you have synchronicity kicks in and that, that distance, it collapses. Bitcoin is a way to eliminate time from the experience of life because of the emission schedule of every 10 minute coins coming into existence. We then orient ourselves not for, to the North Star or to the legacy time systems, but we equate time with money. They become syn synchronistically locked. And then that's part of discovering in our own minds this multiversal node. And then the synchronistic con conversation begins and the time and space collapse and there's no such thing as time and space. And that's happening really, really fast now. And Bitcoin is the vector to, to get us there. That's, that's how we're getting into this is through Bitcoin. Right. And you know what? We actually have to go uh, because we are restricted by time and the time is telling us that we're going to have to go do a podcast with BTC sh sessions in a few minutes. But first I want to say, because we like, I, we like to talk about Michelangelo and Da Vinci and the Renaissance. And, you know, that brings me to Diego Maradona, who died this week of a heart attack at 60. He's the subject of this parody of Michelangelo's fresco, The Creation of Adam, with Maradona's jersey sleeve depicted on the arm. So that's the hand of God. Um, just for people who don't know, it is uh, kind of funny. The hand of God was a phrase used by the Argentine footballer Diego Maradona to describe a goal that he scored during the Argentina versus England quarterfinals match of the 1986 FIFA World Cup. It took place in Mexico City. Uh, under association football rules, Maradona should have received a yellow card for using his hand and the goal disallowed. However, as the referees did not have a clear view of the play and video assistant referee technology did not ex yet exist, the goal stood and Argentina led 1-0. to zero. The game ended with a 2-1 win for the Argentines thanks to a second goal scored by Maradona, known as the goal of the century. After the match, Diego Maradona stated that the goal that he scored with his hand was scored a little with his head and a little with the hand of God. <laughs> right. Well, I would posit that it was that moment in football history that started what we see today, and that is Americans flocking to see Manchester United and Chelsea. And in other words, he suddenly, that news broke globally and it started the interest of America into football, <laughs> I, I would say. And, and so he, uh, more so than Pele, you know, Pele was huge. He played in the United States, but that, but although Pele was the, one of the finest athletes ever to exist, Maradona was truly uh, he, just a, uh, <laughs> a, like he is a Da Vinci of football. I mean, he yeah. is, he, he's like, he's a genius of, of football. He's the 
Ronnie O'Sullivan of football. Yeah, he looks like uh, he could have been painted, especially by Michelangelo. Like, he looked like a character out of one of his paintings. But, like, he does identify American. Americans could identify him for that chutzpah. Like, to to have (laughs) photographs of you touching the wall and say, like, it was the hand of God is something like like Donald Trump would say. I don't know. It must have been God. (laughs) Plus, he didn't look particularly athletic, right? I mean, if you saw him on the street, you wouldn't think this is, like, one of the greatest athletes ever in history. But if you watch him on the football pitch... Uh, you cannot believe what this what's what one can do with a foot and a ball and a hand. That's a good place to end. And uh, thank you for joining us on this episode of Orangeville Podcast. And make sure, again, go to all those affiliate links because everybody in the podcast Telegram group is always like saying, where do I buy Bitcoin? Every time, every single day I wake up and there's like somebody asking where to buy Bitcoin. I'm like, how many times do I have to tell you to go to swampbitcoin.com forward slash Stacy? And how many times do I have to tell you to go to keys.casa forward slash? Well, you know, you put in your discount code of orange pill, all one word. And, you know, how many times do I have to tell you? I don't know. Huh? Probably because everyone's going to swanbitcoin.com forward slash max. <laughs> they're not going to Stacy. I was wondering if you were going to notice that. I mean, that. you know, that's where they're going. You don't notice it because they're not going to that one. They're going to forward slash max. That's where they're going. I mean, I'm, the stats are rolling in. Every day I wake up and I got a mountain of stats fresh. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's it. That's the way. I'm the Maradona of stats. Talk to the hand. Yeah, right. Of God.